<laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the organizers to invite us to chair this, uh, uh, this panel discussion. So um, we all know that um, uh, Portugal has uh, decriminalized uh, drug use and that it, it is a, a model drug policy, but uh, we are not always so familiar about the processes that led to this, to this decision of decriminalizing. And so we hope... Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Hi. We hope today to, uh, to get some details both about how we got to this place in Portugal, uh, about what has been achieved, and about the challenges that remain. So we would like to invite the panelists uh, up to the stage. And our first speaker is uh, Dr. Joao Golau again, uh, but in a different incarnation now. As Cristina mentioned, uh, Joao is well known to many because he has been one of the leading architects and spokespeople for the Portuguese response to drugs. Um, he is the Director General of CICAD the, and the National Drugs Coordinator, and I'm pleased to welcome him to the stage. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, well, yeah, I am again. Uh, well, as you, I, I believe that all of you know that uh, the Portuguese, the Portuguese policy, is mostly known by the fact that we decriminalized the use of every drug twenty years ago. In fact, the the, the law was approved on the twenty second of April of ninety nine. So we just commemorate the the twentieth anniversary of the of the decriminalization. But if decriminalization is really important uh, to turn everything more coherent, uh, since we, we think about uh, uh, drug use, uh, problematic drug use as an health issue rather than a criminal one, uh, in fact, the crime by it itself is not a magic bullet. We need to do much more than that. We need to do a lot of work, we, we must provide treatment to everybody who, who is in need of it, who, who wants it. We need to work on reintegration of people, we need to, to work on prevention, to in informing people. Uh, and prevention is nowadays not only saying just say no, but uh, uh, discussing with people why say no. And uh, on top of this, arm reduction, a set of policies that we have put in place uh, based in the idea that even s someone is still using drugs, he or she still deserves the investment of the state in order to have a better life and a longer life. And this is the basis uh, why the, the Portuguese uh, state, uh, not only the Portuguese government, the, the Portuguese nation, adopted arm reduction as a a, a very important set of policies to address those problems. I would like to tell you that. Uh, ah, okay. Due to historical reasons, the problems in uh, related to drugs in Portugal started uh, later than in most of European countries. As you probably know, we lived for a long time under a dictatorship uh, with a very controlled uh, uh, state, very controlling state, during which, uh, in fact, we had no, no drugs problems. Uh, we were kind of protected by a redoma, by the political police, by the censorship. We lived here isolated from other countries and some movements that happened elsewhere, such as the EP movement or the students' movement in France in the late 60s uh, did not touch us. We were completely isolated. It was in almost impossible for us to travel abroad. We were not a very sexy de destination for, for tourism either. And then, uh, uh, and, and drugs, in fact, were not present in our society. But at the same time, in the last years of the, of the regime, we were also dealing with a colonial war and most of our uh, young male population was sent there mostly against their will and a little bit like uh, like the americans in vietnam 
drug use down there was uh, tolerated or even incentivated in order to, to keep people happy or with, with that war. Suddenly, in 74, the 25th of April of 74, we had our democratic revolution, uh, and shortly after the, the, the beginning of the decolonization process, with the return of, uh, of the soldiers and settlers coming from that, uh, those colonies, uh, so suddenly we are 10 million inhabitants, quite stable, and suddenly we had the return of one, one million people back to mainland, uh, with a huge impact uh, in the in the society. Drug drug use. Well, I, let's say the, the drug use. The, dr the first drug that was made available during that period was, uh, of course, cannabis. Plenty of cannabis, also coming from the ancient colonies with the soldiers. But shortly after, uh, some criminal organizations came and made available all the others. So suddenly we had everything available. So we had heroin, cocaine, LSD, you name it, in a completely unprepared society to deal with it. So sp stepping from one to the other was facilitated by the lack of, of knowledge that we had at, at the time. While other uh, societies, namely European societies, had the opportunity to learn how to deal with, with the, the new phenomenon. Uh, we had no opportunity for it. The state was paying attention to other kind of issues. So it was easy uh, for people. I, I was 20 at the time and I saw it in first, uh, first approach. Uh, uh, it was easy to shift from one to the others without even understanding that we were using different substances. So in just a matter of, uh, let's say, 10 years, uh, we had a huge epidemic, uh, mostly from heroin use. It spread completely, cross-cutting our society, and I, I, I would stress this idea. Uh, differently from what happened in most of, of European countries, wh where drugs problems spread mostly among marginalized people, ethnic or other minorities, uh, a little bit on the ghetto. Here it was complete, completely cross-cutting all social groups. So, of course, it was uh, the, the impact was uh, bigger among the, those groups, but also medium class, mi uh, upper classes, political class, everybody. In just a matter of 10, 10 years, it was almost impossible to find a Portuguese family that had no problems with drugs. So, while in other countries we could see uh, a line for total prevalence of drug use and the most lower, much lower line of problematic drug use, here we, the, the gap between one and the other of those lines was very narrow, almost as if everybody was experimenting drugs became addicted. So the impact of that problematic use, mostly from heroin, I insist, uh, we reached the, the number on 10, 10 million inhabitants. We estimate that by the beginning of the 90s, we could have 100,000 people hooked on heroin with AIDS, AIDS coming along to complicate things, uh, and it started really devastating our, our population. Overdoses deaths, at least one a day, 360 something in the, in the, in the 90s. Uh, HIV infections, as you know, uh, at the time there was no treatment available and people died very, very fast. Uh, also other kind of problems such as uh, Criminality, we never had a big violent criminality uh, shootings and that kind of things, but the petty crimes, acquisitive crimes were very present in our society and very nuisant to, to, to the population. So uh, drug and drug related issues started to uh, go up in the political scale of priorities. We started to develop some responses, some health responses, uh, but things didn't seem to respond in the same uh, proportion of the investment made by, by, by the state. 
So in the late 90s, we uh, felt the lack of a new way to address, uh, to address the problem. Clearly, uh, uh, it was assumed that uh, this problematic drug, drug use was mostly uh, seen by the, by the general population as a, as a health issue rather than a criminal one. Uh, but our law was still very uh, tough and very inspired in the famous war on drugs. So by the end of the, of the 90s, our Prime Minister, uh, Antonio Guterres, who the current Secretary General of the United Nations, decided to convene a group of people, a group of nine people, experts from several areas, uh, from judges to psychiatrists, psychologists, and so on, among whom I was included. Uh, and uh, we were asked to, to uh, build a report, on the, a snapshot on the situation, and to propose new strategic approach, approaches, which we did, new ways to address prevention, treatment, harm reduction, uh, with the formulation that I just told, told you, uh, and uh, 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 reintegration of, of people, all that based in the idea that we were dealing with a health issue rather than a criminal one, and accordingly we proposed the decriminalization of every drug, drug use and possession for use. The only boundary that was put to us by, by the government was, okay, you may propose whatever you want, but you must fit within the spirit of the treaties, of the United Nations treaties. So we went as far as possible within that spirit. As, as you know, the treaties impose a prohibitionist paradigm, uh, and we went as far as possible with it within that paradigm. So, decrim, but uh, keeping some administrative sanctions to uh, drug users. Something that we can compare to the, to the use or not use of the safety belt when you drive. Uh, if you do not wear your safety belt, the police still stops you, intercepts you, may apply you a fine, or in thesis they may impose that you attend a, a training for drivers, but you never get a criminal record that stigmatizes you for life, and you never end up in prison because you are not wearing the safety belt. So this is the idea that I would like to, to, to give you. Uh, the, there is still a clear sign of disapproval by the Portuguese society towards the use of drugs, but it's no longer a crime. And this makes the difference, because it's a law, a law uh, that people think about addiction, problematic use, uh, uh, as a health condition with the same dignity of, as other health conditions, and people who suffer from it have the same dignity as patients who suffer from other diseases. So, and this is the difference. Well, time is running, so I have a couple of slides to show you. This was Lisbon uh, in the 90s, those scenes of open scene of use. Ah, okay. So the first strategy in 99 included uh, a supply side uh, uh, set of policies, uh, but mostly uh, proposals on the demand side based in the principles of humanism and pragmatism, so we had prevention, treatment, harm reduction, social reintegration, decriminalization on top of that, and this makes the integrated approach. And an important component, com component of this strategy is also, ah, <laughs> it's difficult to come, evaluation. Okay. <laughs> uh, looking around, I cannot uh, avoid referring uh, the director of the EMCDDA, Alexis, my good friend is there. Uh, and having this important agency in Lisbon, having them in Portugal has been of great help for our job, mostly on this, on this area. We learned a lot with you, so thank you. Thank you for being, you and your staff for being there. I insist in this idea. Decriminalization of drug use should be understood as one of the measures included in the comprehensive drug approach. This is not the magic bullet, okay? But it's important anyway. 
Well, it only works if we have a, a network of services uh, with whom we can uh, uh, work with uh, and refer uh, or receive our our uh, clients, uh, drug users, uh, either if they are uh, problematic or, or, or just uh, occasional or social uh, users. So we, we need to work with employment and training services, addiction treatment centers, of course, health centers, welfare services, prisons, it's important, the work that has uh, been done in prisons also. Uh, we indicate prevention answers with schools, with police authorities and so on. So. I'll skip this. We try, we'll, we try to uh, intervene in all those contexts. Uh, as uh, what uh, uh, concerns arm reduction, there's a lot of... Uh, we have a, a law that has been passed in 2001 that uh, uh, provides us the framework for installing different responses all those who are here, low threshold methadone, methadone programs, opioid substitution therapy for other and, and other drug dependence treatments, needle exchange programs, and so on. Drug checking, uh, until now it's only possible in, in recreational settings, but we are thinking, we are discussing the possibility of making it available in a more uh, broadened uh, uh, way. Those uh, responses tend mostly on outreach, street teams, refugees, cell, uh, shelters, contact and information points, drop-in centers, mobile outreach it, uh, teams, cabinets of psychosocial support, and supervised drug consumption rooms. We are, we are just opening uh, recently in Lisbon, the first experience in Portugal ever. This is the, perhaps the slide that uh, gives, her more, gives us more satisfaction about the results. You can see that the uh, red line is the prevalence of HIV, or the, the incidence of, of HIV infections uh, among uh, people, uh, people who use drugs. Uh, this is among heterosexuals and this homo or bisexuals. Well, this green light, green green line, is the uh, needle and syringe exchange program. Okay, it started in '93, and as you can see, as it as it uh, uh, ramped, uh, we had a decrease on HIV infection. And these are methadone programs the red, red line. Well, the reduction of drug-related deaths. You, we can see, as I told you, uh, in the 90s we had at least one overdose is dead a day, 360-something. Uh, uh, those are the numbers in the, in the last years. In 2011 we had 19 overdoses deaths. In 2017 we had 38 overdoses deaths all over the world, all over the, the year in the whole country. I think this is one of the lowest uh, prevalence rates uh, in, in all European countries. <laughs> and this is? Uh, time is up, okay. <laughs> okay. Ah, just, just this. Since 2001, since the approval of the, of the strategy, we, we could see small increases reported on illicit drug use among adults, not necessarily problematic dr drug use, but a reduction in illicit drug use am among adolescents, reduced burden of drug offenders on the criminal justice system, reduction in the prevalence of injecting drug use, Reduction in opiate-related deaths and infectious diseases. Re reduced stigma of drug users. This is a curious side effect of the criminalization. Increase in the amount of drugs seized by the authorities. Since 
the police authorities got rid of all the tasks related to mere users. They could address their attention and their activity and their their resources to serious, uh, to, to, to big uh, traffic organizations. So by the end of the year, they show much more uh, amounts of drug seized than before the criminalization. Well, and overall, a reduction in the public burden caused by drugs. I apologize for this, for the, for the time I took you on top of, and thank you. Thank you very much. No thank worries, no, no worries. Uh, thank you very much we are for your presentation and sorry for cutting it. Uh, we are going to welcome our next speaker, Guilherme Macedo. Guilherme is uh, the director of the Department of Gastroenterology at the Hospital Center of San Jean in Porto. And he is also associated professor in the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Porto. Nice Portuguese, though. Very good, thank you. Um, uh, first things first, uh, I would like to thank to the organizing committee, especially to Cristina and Ricardo, for this very honorable invitation to give this um, bird's eye view of a, a clinician. Uh, so I'm a doctor, I represent a hospital here in, in Porto, and I represent, in fact, a bunch of uh, very interested people and young people uh, related to uh, this very hot topic of HCV elimination. The, um, I think the first word should be about the concept of microelimination. So very briefly, we'll talk about what is the concept of microelimination, where do we stand at this time in Portugal, what is our concept of go there and solve it, and in try we try to give some real life proofs of concept, and finally a last slide of roadmap for the future. Um, Microelimination emphasizes choosing the most relevant interventions to a population of interest. That means it's micro elimination. And in fact, that means that we tailor them in accordance with evidence about the population's needs. So we go for targeting any a specific population and, and we can, and we are able to track how they contribute to progress towards publicly agreed upon elimination goals. And ESL, the European Association for the Study of Liver, when defined this concept, uh, saying that in fact, it would mean that it would break down national elimination goals into smaller goals for individual population segments and for which treatment and prevention interventions can be, they can be delivered much more quickly and efficiently using, using targeted methods. Of course, this means that there can be a great deal of variation uh, concerning the geographic scope of microelimination efforts. Specific populations nationally or smaller scale should, such as regionally or at city level. So it is in fact in the hand of the doctors to state and to define creatively which are the populations to be targeted to. The task at hand should require always a multi-stakeholder planning and implementation process. Um, the other thing is that in fact microelimination achievable goals with ongoing successes do in fact inspire more combative efforts. So we prove a concept and we go further along the road. Microelimination approaches encourage the uptake of new models of care, such as co-location of services, or shifting HCV testing, for example, and treatment sites to different hospital departments, or even outside hospital settings, as we are going to show you. It may substantially contribute to the concept of treatment as prevention. Now, the concept of God, go there and solve it that we try to develop in our specific department has to be, uh, of course, uh, in, included in, in this strategy and within a uh, environment which Portugal has at this time for the access to direct uh, antiviral agents. Since 2016, several direct antiviral agents regimens are available in Portugal, 
with no restrictions based on liver disease stage, which is extremely important, or uh, concerning drug or and alcohol use or abuse, no cap on number of patients treated per year, there are some national guidelines on hepatitis C treatment, and there is a so-called national strategy plan for HIV infection and viral hepatitis. But we have some very important restrictions. Prescribers do not include general practitioners. Only public hospitals dispense these direct antiviral agents following central approval, which is another step that can be problematic sometimes. And all patients need to be registered with a fibrosis assessment, genotype and viral load, which sometimes it's also complicated. So that's why in our department we try to develop these to, to overcome uh, strategies to overcome some inequities to the access to these drugs. And so we develop three pilot projects. The, and the eponyms are there, Hippocrates program, Night Watch program and the PICO program. Hippocrates stand for hepatitis C in prison program for enhancing cure rates. The night watch for the night shelters with almhouses and homeless clinics towards C hepatitis elimination. And the PICO program protocol for integrated community based approach on hepatitis C elimination. So it's our ground, it's treating hepatitis C. And why did we go there to the uh, Establishment Prisional do Porto in Custóias, nearby here in, in Porto? because it's a, it's a marvelous place, it's a prison, and we have wonderful, a wonderful doctor that we come close to uh, every time we, we can, and he's here, Dr. Rui Morgado, which in fact made very easy this di very difficult and very innovative task of getting into the hospital, into the prison. And why did you go there? Because prisoners represent an important gap in linkage to care concerning hepatitis C. Prison officials had scarce information on EPC, new treatment regimens, which was not the case of Dr. Rui Morgado, by the way. But in fact, generally, this is the environment. Uh, there is a long time frame from referral to assessment, and funneling of patients to a minority of specialists do create a bottleneck resulting in long appointment wait times. No access of prison doctors to the platform for DAA prescription and there are minimal human resources and difficult logistics, for example, trans transportation to hepatitis C hospital outpatient clinic. So we had a baseline HIV screening for all inmates and we had a clinical appointment locally for all HIV positive detective prisoners, patients, and we had a first consultation. We went there for the first consultation, getting medical history, of course, and some, getting some blood chemistry and RNA to define if there was ongoing viral infection. And with a portable device of a fibro scan, we did the assessment of fibrosis of the liver of these, all these patients, uh, all HCV positive patients. The second consultation, when we went there, we defined the two different population, either RNA negative, no ongoing viral repli replication, and we provided, of course, some education and healthcare recommendations, of course, and referral to our unit if there was otherwise liver disease. And if they were RNA positive, ongoing viral replication, we prescribed uh, the treatment. So a third time, at the end of therapy, either eight to 12 weeks, uh, and that would be related to the regimen that we used, again, the clinical appraisal, and again, the uh, opportunity for education and healthcare recommendations. And finally, a fourth consultation, uh, providing the confirmation of cure, which was in fact a, 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 an obvious reason to go there, um, eventually rescheduling for new treatment, which is not the case for the moment, providing again education and healthcare recommendations, which is extremely important in the prisoner in environment. And if possible, every six months, blood tests, including RNA again, to define uh, the eventual uh, reinfection. Any other diagnostic procedure that we find extremely important to, to perform, we would do that in our gastroenterology department in our hospital. Now, this is the results that we have so far. Uh, more than 1,200 uh, screened patients, 190 were anti-HCV positive, more infected patients, 96 tested positive for RNA, all enrolled for treatment. The mean time for detection RNA was 21 days. The mean time from baseline to therapy initiation, 
28 days, which in fact is less than the many times we have that in the hospitals uh, till now, and the third com therapy compliance was 100%. This is the overall demographics, and I would just state importantly that uh, some of the uh, reasons commonly found in, in the, the prisoners, and of, of course the genotype distribution, which w it was what we expected in terms of genotype 1, 1A and 1B, and uh, genotype 3, one third of the patients, and only 8% with genotype 4. Very interestingly, the mean um, values of some liver tests were absolutely normal in the majority of these patients. Another important issue is that liver fibrosis that we evaluated with Faber scan showed that almost 80% of these patients had low fibrosis, which, they were, which means that they were very uh, prone to be cured on a first um, approach, and which was the case. So um, the other programs that we developed uh, was the night watch program still ongoing and for now you you have we have th 300 screened patients with a uh, quick test and then defining the, the positive uh, patients we would go there and we went there to uh, look for RNA and uh, giving them the treatment exactly as we did in the prison setting in the PICO program, again, we used the quick test for HCV screening, and we have screened in, the, uh, in our um, Centro de Saúde, in, in the big area of Porto, uh, Oriental Porto. We went there and we are screening all the population with more than 18 years old. Until now, only with one month going, 3,500 screened uh, patients, 14 were anti-HCV positive, and again, we define we, who were RNA positive to begin treatment. The mean time for RNA detection for the first visit, 10 days. And the mean time from baseline to therapy initiation, 20 days. Again, the ther therapy compliance, 100%. So this is the uh, proof of the concept of go there and solve it, which I think will be the answer in the coming years to solve this HIV issue in the population. So finally, what do we uh, find for a roadmap with our examples? These programs show that the tertiary hepatology consultation is feasible in the outpatient, and I would say out of the hospital setting, with exceptionally high performance in terms of access to treatment and efficacy. As examples of improved linkage to care, these strategies may provide the trigger for a national program on HCV microelimination. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guillermo, and you uh, were kind enough to allow us to recapture a little bit of time. Uh, I feel it important to remind the audience that biomedical interventions don't just happen by themselves, but require the participation of visionary providers and also commitment of patients and people living okay. with the conditions we seek to treat. And our next speaker is a great testament to that. Luis Mendel was diagnosed with HIV and hepatitis in 1996. He has been chair of the European AIDS Treatment Action Group. He is chair of the board of GAT, a treatment activist group here in Portugal. Uh, he is also a co-chair of the Civil Society Forum on HIV in, in, uh, here in Europe, and um, it's a great pleasure to welcome him to the stage. Luis. Uh, thank you, uh, um, Daniel Wolf. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, the organizers. I think that I, I will try to go very quickly, and I see that I have... Uh, uh, you can put it running because it's uh, not running uh, for, for the, the moment. I think that a call to action for elimination of HCV, HIV, NTB, it's uh, among people using drugs, it's something that is very important. And if we succeed, we also give a step in making, because I think that UNITE is global, uh, to make a global better world uh, that uh, would be very good news. Uh, regarding the, uh, um, the team of the uh, things that we uh, have on this uh, session, 
uh, de decriminalization as a successful uh, model in Portugal. I must remind that though early, uh, younger than me, decriminalization is near 20 years old. Uh, and I think that it was a, a, a great step uh, and a step that is still inspiring some countries. Uh, but I cannot uh, say uh, that I'm uh, happy and that is the end of the uh, story. I think that the, as democracy and freedom, uh, the uh, reforms, the drug policy reforms, can always go further and uh, make it better. And I think that it's a good time now, now that some of us are about to retire, uh, that we could finish and give some additional steps that I consider, uh, in fact, extremely crucial. Uh, and uh, I will not go there, of course. I must declare out of conflict of interest that I'm since 83, I think, an anti-prohibitionist and a pro-legalizer on uh, drugs under a, a very concrete framework. Uh, I'm not a libertarian in drugs, but I'm in favor of, uh, of regulation and uh, regulation and uh, a legal uh, framework. Otherwise, I don't think that we can finish the things. And I will try this thing. So <coughs> the task that I was, and I, I, I swear I will be uh, quick. Uh, the, the, uh, the task I was uh, um, assigned was how can we uh, involve and work and make the participation of the key groups possible. Uh, and I think that this is a challenge. And in one side, we need people like uh, uh, Professor Guilherme from and uh, Rui Tato Marinho that are available to work with us because we need the best specialists. We don't need the bad specialists or non-specialists. Uh, but we also need to provide them the conditions of access to uh, these uh, people. So <coughs> GAT, my Portuguese organization, it uh, uh, organized themselves as uh, uh, proximity-based services provided by the community, but with the best uh, in uh, science, evidence, and uh, medical stuff. So we have a point that targets mainly MSM, that for HIV, and now also for HCV, because they like to be on the stage, so also they got a, a way of getting infected with hepatitis C. Uh, Espaço Intendente is for, uh, mainly for sex workers, migrants, and trans women, a very uh, forgotten uh, community uh, that some say that doesn't exist. In our portfolio, we have around 1,000, near 1,000 uh, transgender women uh, that we provide services and that work with us. In Moraria, it's uh, mainly for uh, the people that use drugs and moves, as the name says, that moves, uh, tries to cover in the south of Lisbon the key populations. Another thing that I would like uh, to say is that the populations are not divided nicely among themselves. So you can have MSMs that are also using drugs and that are also migrants, and we have all of these uh, 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 things. So we, more, uh, we say more that we have services that are specialized to, go to deliver the needs on the needs of the key populations. And but the populations can then migrate among in between our services according to uh, uh, their needs. Another uh, thing that uh, uh, we uh, try to organize and to demonstrate, and maybe this is foolish, eh? but it's the uh, way uh, that Portugal is uh, very bad and non-reliable epidemiological data. So we tried as a community organization 
on where it's more difficult to do good surveillance and data production and knowledge production. So we have the, uh, uh, the network of uh, the, the screening. We have now, uh, and CAD is of course for something that it should be in the heart of everyone, anti-discrimination and stigma and in favor of legalization. And peer-to-peer, -peer, it's because we understood that sometimes we send the, the, the patients to uh, Rui Tato Marinho and Guilherme. Well, we got less to Guilherme because we have more, more in the south, but uh, then they disappear. The hospitals are not a nice place, a nice welcoming place for most of the people that use drugs. And this must be also, we can do something about it, but probably the big solution is to move, the, to go with the services to where people uh, live. And condom is very basic now that we all talk about PrEP. I don't know if uh, what this uh, uh, audience uh, is or not familiar. It's a very fancy new uh, preventive uh, technology for uh, HIV, but I think that condoms still need to be widely promoted as they are less and less used. <coughs> and we have initiatives that I will not talk n now except to say one is on participation of all the uh, patients and patient organizations outside of the HIV world and the hepatitis world and has been very successful and we got a medal from the Minister of Health. I don't know if it's a good sign or a bad sign, but uh, we got it. And the other one is something that I think that also needs to be done, is the special responsibility of Portugal towards the Lusophone uh, world. Uh, we have very difficult challenges in the, uh, in the official countries, uh, the countries officially speaking Portuguese, and I think that, well, I don't know if we have Brazilian friends, neither Portugal, neither Brazil did enough yet to uh, help to find solutions for uh, these. Uh, so we are trying to make a, a network of uh, the, and let's see if it will. This is very simple, though it's fancy. It looks like a tulip. It's to say that because we provide four tests instead of one, we get much more infections and we don't need infections that in models that only offer HIV uh, uh, screening or hepatitis screening miss other uh, infections. And my young uh, colleagues uh, are doing PhDs, et cetera, at, out of this uh, model. Oh. This is uh, always the same thing that I will not have time as uh, you got me. And I will go very quickly over the uh, questions of uh, the, uh, the places that uh, I was talking about. As you uh, can see, uh, either on uh, condoms, we are probably the bigger condom distributor in Portugal among the non-governmental organizations. And I would say also among the governmental organizations, except for the Directorate General of Health that buys the four million condoms every year, but they don't distribute it. We need to go there and pick them. And uh, the uh, reactive percentage of uh, the tests that we perform in thousands are very high. And uh, among uh, any uh, cost e e efficiency uh, uh, analysis, this is highly effective. Uh, what we do this, uh, what we do regarding the number of infections identified. And <coughs> just to remember, this is sex workers, migrants and uh, trans women, of course, trans women and migrants of African origin have the highest uh, uh, percentage of, um, of reactive tests. 
uh, moves it's uh, quite different but I would uh, like you to see how we learn how to use more efficiently the mobile unit the two first years that are on uh, blue and uh, I don't know what color it is kind of uh, reddish etc to uh, the results when uh, in grey and yellow you see that we tripled the number of not only tests performed but also the infections uh, um, identified and I think that now that the resources are very scarce these ways of making more efficient work uh, maintaining the quality are uh, very important uh, in Moreria it's where some of you have been and uh, shown it's not mainly the mainly uh, target of uh, uh, in Moreria it's to provide this b daily services for people using drugs but even on the uh, tests and uh, infections uh, um, the results are uh, quite impressive apart from uh, 71,000 uh, people that uh, went to this very small uh, center it's quite uh, impressive in my opinion and uh, shows how needed the service, the service was uh, this is also the progression on uh, our uh, contribution for the first 90 uh, or the first 90s in hepatitis B, hepatitis C uh, and HIV uh, <coughs> that we want uh, as much people living with these infections identified as possible uh, and you also uh, can see a huge progression we started in 2011 with only one test and then we uh, uh, put a second one and then a third one so uh, that's also why you see the uh, results this is regarding MSM so a very specific uh, population uh, where we are the we are identifying the near more than 50 percent of all the MSM with HIV in uh, the uh, region of Lisbon and more than 30 percent of uh, the MSM with uh, HIV in the country oh god so but I have the here uh, uh, parliamentarian so I can advocate for that the problem with our first 90 that we don't know exactly uh, where to, uh, we are and the data is a little crap uh, the, the second problem is the second 90 for all these infections because we don't know how efficient linkage to care is and more importantly we don't know how many people will lose in the first year after being in the hospital and we lose a lot and on hepatitis C it's really a lot I don't know the data in Porto so I cannot estimate but I know well the data in Setúbal, Almada, uh, Barreiro, Lisbon uh, so I can say so we are developing a strategy that can be monitored that can be cost efficient involving the peers to give support in literacy in uh, with lawyers because some people have these problems with justice very common with uh, social support or social uh, conditions but also in treatment literacy and I think that the, uh, uh, the always looking for autonomy uh, and we will present in another conference these results because I think they are very efficient but euros allocated by the state to uh, finance this contribution for the second 90 zero uh, oh, today I had a long so I had finished my time uh, I had this uh, question on drug consumption rooms I'm in favor of drug consumption rooms 
I'm also in favor, and I know that uh, we sometimes cannot say that, of civil disobedience to bad laws. Uh, and that's what we are doing. Uh, and I don't involve my partners, but uh, we started a naloxone, a peer naloxone program without legal uh, framework, but with medical framework to uh, work on uh, access to naloxone. And we think by humanitarian reasons, there are some of our clients and friends that need absolutely this kind of services. So we will provide them. Uh, and we uh, make ourselves uh, very miserable uh, in money by uh, building this place that is for the microillumination of hepatitis C among people using drugs in Lisbon with Rui Tato Marinho, but at the same time for providing an important French, stu French origin study on uh, literacy on uh, safe in safer injection. Uh, and this takes place in this uh, very nice place. Uh, Thank you, sorry to take so much time, but it's faster than usual. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Luis. And I think now actually speaking of drug consumption rooms, uh, because there is not one currently in Porto, uh, colleagues in Lisbon, I believe, have prepared a video for us. I'm not sure how the video how to initiate the video, so I, uh, I guess it will appear. A área das dependências é complexa e não tem respostas fáceis. Além da aposta na prevenção e nos tratamentos, é necessário continuar a trabalhar com as pessoas durante o período em que consomem drogas. Os programas de consumo vigiado dirigem-se a pessoas muito fragilizadas em termos sociais e de saúde. No próprio espaço são prestados vários serviços nestas áreas. Inicia-se um contacto regular que progressivamente servirá para restituir direitos de cidadania, criar acesso a outros serviços, como, por exemplo, a ligação aos cuidados de saúde primários ou a consultas hospitalares e o acesso a apoios sociais. Criam-se também condições para consumir sob supervisão de profissionais treinados para atuar em caso de situações de emergência. Assim, salvam-se vidas, reduz-se o risco de infecções, reforça-se o contato com o sistema, Queremos proteger a saúde das pessoas que usam drogas e, em última análise, cuidar da saúde da cidade no seu conjunto. Nós temos a felicidade de ter uma, uma estratégia nacional que eh, enquadra um conjunto muito alargado de respostas, um modelo integrado com respostas na, nas várias áreas, desde a prevenção ao tratamento, à redução de riscos e minimização de danos, à reinserção social. Esta resposta está prevista na nossa legislação desde 2001. E esta resposta, no quadro das múltiplas respostas que a Câmara Municipal de Lisboa tem oferecido à população utilizadora de drogas na cidade, em colaboração com as entidades do Ministério da Saúde, nomeadamente o CICAD e a ARS Lisboa e Val do Tejo, portanto, considerou-se necessário ou vantajoso Uh, somar às respostas existentes, mais esta, portanto, um espaço de consumo vigiado e seguro uh, que possa servir para captar uh, as franjas da população mais desorganizada e por essa via contribuir para que tenham uma melhor esperança de vida e uma melhor qualidade de vida. O programa de consumo vigiado da cidade de Lisboa resulta de uma atividade diagnóstica realizada pela EDICAD e que evidenciou a necessidade de completar a rede existente eh, com outro tipo de respostas para chegar a populações eh, que habitualmente não são tão facilmente tocadas. É um programa para nós essencial enquanto estrutura de saúde da RSLVT, na medida em que permite eh, trabalhar questões relacionadas com o VIH, com a hepatite C, eh, tão presente nestas populações, estabelecendo pontos com o resto da estrutura da ARS. Os cuidados de saúde primários, a primeira linha, os, as esterilidades nos hospitais e, portanto, nessa medida pareceu-nos absolutamente essencial o desenvolvimento desta atividade. A pessoa com comportamentos aditivos que, que nós encontramos encontramos diariamente na rua, encontra-se a consumir em situações de uma, de uma fragilidade enorme, quer ao nível da sua vida pessoal, quer depois ao nível da, da sua vida até social e familiar. 
um programa de consumo vigiado é um local onde as pessoas podem consumir de forma segura, onde usarão material assético para consumo, na, sob a supervisão de uma equipa especializada. As pessoas terão acesso a vários serviços, como rastreios a doenças infecciosas, a cuidados de enfermagem. Poderão ter acesso também a serviços sociais, onde poderão ser encaminhados para outros serviços de saúde, sociais ou de tratamento. Nós confrontamos-nos com, com as pessoas a consumir em situações uh, degradantes e que já não é suposto no nosso país acontecer. O nosso país que tem vindo a ser reconhecido mundialmente como um, um bom exemplo e um país de boas práticas na, na abordagem ao problema das drogas e do tratamento das dependências. Os programas de consumo vigiado farão com que quem consome substâncias psicoativas o fará de uma forma segura e, e discreta e a comunidade uh, irá beneficiar também com isso porque não terá que conviver com esse tipo de consumos à sua porta e, e perto dos seus bairros. Consumir na rua é sempre desagradável, a pessoa está muito exposta, o risco é muito maior. <coughs> Em termos, por exemplo, de overdose, se estiver sozinho, ou mesmo que esteja com alguém que pode não ter o mínimo de conhecimento para resolver a situação, ou haver a unidade, esse risco não, não existe. A pessoa está muito mais protegida, muito mais à vontade. Ao ver este projeto, adquirem uma informação que até aí não tinham, e isso é benéfico porque eles próprios, uns aos outros, vão transmitir esses conhecimentos, vão passar a consumir com uma, com uma, de uma maneira muito mais correta, sem riscos de saúde e o que também é uma mais-valia para todas as pessoas. O nosso objetivo no programa de consumo vigiado é chegar aos utilizadores que, que estão em condições de maior vulnerabilidade, que estão a consumir na rua e que têm uh, pouco acesso aos serviços. A unidade móvel vai ter um papel muito importante na ligação aos cuidados de saúde e a toda a rede de serviços da cidade de Lisboa. É particularmente importante a ligação na área do VIH e hepatites virais. Portanto, nós faremos o rastreio aqui na unidade e depois faremos o acompanhamento às consultas e o apoio durante todo o processo, durante a fase de tratamento. Bom dia, meu nome é Diana, sou assistente social do Programa de Consumo Vigiado Móvel, que vai intervir no Conselho de Lisboa, em duas freguesias da cidade. Podemos entrar para conhecer o espaço? Neste primeiro espaço temos o local onde é feito o consumo, portanto temos dois locais para o consumo de substâncias psicoativas. Temos aqui o material que é disponibilizado para os utentes para realizar o consumo dentro da unidade móvel. Neste outro espaço, mais reservado, temos o gabinete de enfermagem médico e de atendimento psicossocial e rastreios para as infecções do VIH, hepatites virais e sífilis. Para além destes serviços, fazemos todo o acompanhamento e encaminhamento aos serviços, seja na área da saúde e social. A estratégia de 2001 relativa ao combate à droga no nosso país marcou um ponto de viragem fundamental. Um ponto de viragem em Portugal, mas também um ponto de viragem na forma como na Europa e no mundo se começou a olhar para a questão da toxicodependência. Fundamentalmente, a viragem foi passarmos a olhar para a toxicodependência menos como um problema de repressão, mais como um problema de saúde individual e pública. Mais como um problema de inserção e de apoio àqueles que caem na situação de toxicodependência do que um problema de repressão individual. Uma estratégia que deu resultados, que deu frutos que foi desenvolvida em múltiplos domínios da prevenção, do tratamento, à reinserção dos toxicodependentes. Mas na estratégia de 2001 sobrou um instrumento, uma peça fundamental que nunca chegou a ser implementada, os programas de consumo vigiado. Foi este passo que nós decidimos tomar na cidade de Lisboa, avançar com os programas de consumo vigiado. Conhecemos bem o debate que a nível internacional se fez sobre esta matéria. Conhecemos bem, aliás, as experiências de outros países, mas creio que em Lisboa temos boas condições para avançar. Porque, em primeiro lugar, o país já tem um histórico relativamente ao quadro legal e ao quadro penal. Isso é da maior importância para que estes programas funcionem. Em segundo lugar, porque será feito em diálogo com as comunidades, a criação de locais, 
que permitam, de forma segura, de forma atenta, de forma cuidada, que o consumo pelos toxicodependentes se realize, mas também se estabeleçam as bases de confiança que alicercem o programa de reinserção social de muitos que, por vezes, já caíram fora das malhas do que é uma sociedade coesa e integrada. Queremos, com este nosso programa, com esta nossa decisão, dar o passo decisivo, o último passo de uma estratégia que honrou o país. Honrou o país pela sua inovação, pela sua humanidade e, acima de tudo, honrou o país pelos resultados que conseguiu atingir. Hoje, Portugal é uma referência que continua a ser procurada por muitos internacionalmente para verem como é que nós conseguimos fazer esta, esta centragem na pessoa humana, na dignidade da pessoa humana, na saúde pública, na segurança das comunidades e, no fundo, de uma melhor vida para todos no nosso país e nas nossas cidades. Ok, so we are now going to welcome our two commentators who will have the chance to comment on the presentation that we have heard. And uh, first, we will welcome José Queiroz. Uh, José is the executive director of APDESH. Sorry for the pronunciation, if it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> And also the host of the Harm Reduction International 2019 conference. José's advocacy focus on peer work in Portugal, involvement of peer work, civil society involvement in drug policy, and the funding for harm reduction. José, you have not 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, uh, so it's working already? Yeah, yeah. okay, so good afternoon. Um, thank you very much to Unite, Ricardo Batista Leite, uh, to the um, President of the Charity of Porto, Santa Casa Medical do Porto, and <coughs> the other colleagues present here for the invitation. Also, thank you very much to Naomi from uh, Harm Reduction International, and thank you for the speakers for their their own, you know, um, nice and interesting speech. So I need to be short, and I will try to be short, honestly. Um, And to say, uh, actually, part of this uh, I have said yesterday uh, in the afternoon to some journalists, but I think it goes quite well here. And the first thing is that when Jean Golan was saying that in that now we are, you know, achieving the 20 years of our national strategy uh, or our decolonization model, um, I realize and I was trying to remember what were more or less the principles, the values of the Portuguese you know, national strategy on decriminalization or fighting against drugs. Actually, that was the first name of the strategy. And actually, when you look to that, when you go to the papers and read the document, what you can see is that <clears throat> uh, participation, humanism, pragmatism, and evidence-based were there as the main pillars to build a new law for the, uh, for the Portuguese uh, drugs issues in our society. And if we look to harm reduction principles, we can see that participation, pragmatism, evidence-based approach, and um, inclusion are the main values and the main pillars of harm reduction. Today, our speakers were saying, for example, that um, Prevention, and João Colão was saying that, prevention is no more uh, about saying no, it's more about why I am telling you no. So, for harm reduction perspective, from my perspective, I believe that harm reduction tell us or teach us why do I need to say you no? Why am I obliging you to do th something that you don't want to do. So if we want really to establish a dialogue with someone about drug use, so maybe it's better that you don't start with a no. Maybe it will be better that you somehow create a common ground and say, you know, my perspective is no, but maybe you are saying yes, maybe you want to use drugs, and I do want to understand why are you doing that. 
So this is more or less one of my understandings about harm reduction. And that means that when I am coming to people with some kind of knowledge and technical approach and values, I'm also coming with a kind of ideology. And I maybe I could try to impose my ideology or maybe I could try to open myself to try to understand the idiosyncrasy of others that are in front of me. That means that maybe I could try to accept why are they using drugs. So for me, this is a kind of huge moral progress that we have, that we had and we still have in Portugal, is that, that we can have two people staying at the same stage saying what Joan was saying about prevention and the no word, let's say, putting, of course, a question on that, so meaning that even Joan now is getting more and more progressive. That's very nice. I'm, I respect <laughs> Joan because of that. But the second one is like a person like me that doesn't have the same, you know, status, bio, and so on, like Joan Golan has, so I'm not a, a global star. I'm not even a star in my home, so I'm the kind of, you know, anonymous citizen. Can come here and say, maybe I do not agree with the perspective of Joan Golan. And so for me, this is also a kind of you know, new room that decriminalization and harm reduction have opened here in Portugal. So people can debate about drugs. That means that maybe Joan Golan is also not correct in this particular issue when we were saying, dear Joan, that in Portugal, drug use is still a huge problem or still a kind of a social phenomenon. I don't remember now, sorry for that. But I, I, I was trying to be accurate with your words, but I don't remember now. So a kind of, you know, there, there was a kind of issue on that. So I could say, from my perspective, did we ask that to the new generations using drugs, for example? Do they consider that a kind of issue? Do we have stats for that? Have we make surveys? Have we make um, inquisitions to the people trying to understand what is their real perspective in our days about the use of drugs and the problematic use of drugs? That's one of my statements. Can I have more two minutes? Is that possible? Or no? One minute. One minute. The second one, uh, it's about go there and solve it, that uh, Professor Guilherme was saying. So maybe we, I, and I know that that was what you're trying to say, I'm pretty sure that maybe we could say, go there, include people, let them participate, and then we can solve it. Once again, this goes for one of the main values of decriminalization and harm reduction, inclusion, participation. Without that, it's not possible to achieve a better treatment, it's not possible to outreach people and to make them a part of the solution. Finally, my congrats to the people of Lisbon that they were capable to open a mobile van of uh, mobile van to uh, protect people when they are injecting drugs or smoking drugs. But still, that we have a kind of tricky thing in Portugal. We can do not or cannot open a goddamn DCR, a real one, a drug consumption room something that could be fixed, something that could be seen by people, something that could be appointed on the street. So still that means that we are, our politicians, and this is for Ricardo Batista Leite, I know that he was fighting for these kind of things, our politicians still have a lack of courage, still are not consistent between what they are saying and what they need to do and they, what they need to accomplish to better treat people and to give them uh, the well-being that all of us uh, deserve. So thank you very much and thank you very much to you. So last comment comes from Dr. Rui uh, Tato Marino. And as you heard from Luis's comments, he is a distinguished hepatologist. He is the head of the Department of Gastroenterology at the Medical School of Lisbon. He has uh, more than 100 publications. The floor is yours. Uh, only five minutes. Sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ricardo and uh, Cristina and all the other staff for inviting me. Uh, so um, I'm a hepatologist. I'm the liver man, <laughs> as uh, <laughs> Guilherme, uh, gastroenterology and hepatologist. So my mission uh, in life, one of my missions in life, uh, the government is paying us, is to, to save lives and avoid cancer. So back to basics. Uh, I would like to um, to link all the presentations, the marvelous presenta presentations, but we have to, to talk a little bit about facts and numbers and people dying. I know very well the devastation uh, at m when I was 15 years old 
in my streets, even in my family, people dying for uh, from overdoses, car accidents, motorcycle accidents, related with the consumption, not only of, uh, drugs, but also uh, alcohol. I remember uh, very well. At that time, 1991, I was a resident in gastroenterology, uh, already focused in uh, liver patients, because I've seen a lot of liver patients uh, dying. It's, uh, we can avoid that. But at that time, 1991, we have published in a Portuguese international journal, At America Portuguesa, the, one of the first reports in Portugal about the high rate uh, of hepatitis C in people who inject uh, drugs. Uh, at that time, uh, the rate was 80%. So it's also a devastation uh, for uh, the livers of that, that people. Um, we have a, a very good framework, uh, organization, national organization, uh, juridic organization, saying, saying so, as explained by João Golo. So now the medical doctors, uh, the clinicians uh, at the university hospitals, like uh, we and Guilherme, we are able to approach and to save lives and avoid uh, cancers. Um, since five years ago, uh, marvelous, like a miracle, has appeared the the new drugs for hepatitis uh, C, the so-called DAAs, antiviral uh, drugs, is um, uh, a magic history in in medicine. And if you have uh, without side effects, two we two uh, months or three months without side effects, real uh, side effects, you are able to cure. Uh, for example, in 1,000 uh, patients, only one of them will not be cured. The first, efficacy, the, the first treatment, the efficacy is 97%, and if uh, the 3% who didn't respond uh, at the first time, uh, the rate is again uh, 97%. So only one patient in 1,000 will not be cured. If we, uh, we eliminate the virus, we can save lives. Uh, people will not have uh, liver cirrhosis. If they have liver cirrhosis, they, we are avoiding uh, liver cancer. Liver cancer is expecting to uh, increase in the next 30 years. It's one of the most important cancers in the world. And uh, liver disease, back to basics, facts and numbers, liver disease is now in Europe, also in Portugal, the seventh cause of death. Uh, combination sometimes of hepatitis C and alcohol, but it's one of the major uh, case, uh, major situations uh, of, liver, uh, of liver death. So uh, what do we have to do? We have the tools, uh, framework, uh, organization, juridic and uh, social. A lot of people uh, like Zeker uh, in the field working very well approaching people who are dying, who are suffering, not only for overdoses, but also for uh, from liver cancer. And we have to uh, link all the stakeholders, the university uh, medical uh, clinicians like us. We have to go out of the hospital, uh, to go to prisons, go to homeless, uh, go to other migrants. We have to, to deal right now with a lot of migrants. So we have to learn a lot from uh, uh, Luis Mendel, from José Queiroz, from uh, João Golo, and link to the, together, work to Decker, together like a football team, like Benfica, is one of the best <laughs> in, in the world, Benfica, and to save lives, to, to avoid uh, cancer. Uh, repeating is my mission. Uh, we have the tools, the, the very uh, good uh, drugs, one of, the, one of the best drugs in the world. Uh, I don't know uh, more diseases that we are able to, to cure uh, more than 95.9%. Uh, uh, so uh, for me, it's at the end of the line, a question of a human rights to save uh, these people. Uh, and we have the tools for the, the liver for hepatitis C. Perhaps is uh, the first or the second cause of death in these people. In Portugal, they, have, they are in the 50s uh, right now. People who have survived the overdoses in HIV. So we have the tools, uh, we have to work uh, together like a soccer team. Thank you.
so now we seek some guidance from the organizers uh, because we don't want to keep you from coffee, but we also want to allow some possibility for questions. So may we extend by five minutes beyond the original intended end time? So thank you. Thank you all to all the speakers. We have our multidisciplinary team here on the stage, or our football squad. Um, the floor is now open for brief comments or questions. If you wouldn't mind identifying yourself when you speak, and, and because time is limited, to please uh, keep your comment or question brief. Uh, I don't know that we have a microphone. Oh, there is one coming, so just raise your hand and uh, the microphone will come to you. Hello? Yeah. Um, good afternoon. I'm uh, Mambu Medien. I'm the Africa Program Officer for the Global Drug Policy Program at Open Society Foundations. Um, th there was just a mention of uh, generational differences in, um, in the approach um, to decriminalization and the Portuguese model. Uh, we were meeting with some people who work with uh, cosmic care and uh, drug testing at festivals. And uh, they were saying that uh, there's a difference in the way the police um, approaches the issue, namely that the older generation who was exposed to the heroin epidemic is much more open um, to decriminalization of the mall as it functions, while the newer generation of police officers who have not are considering that it's being too lax on drug users and that they're not fulfilling their role as the police. Um, and I was wondering how this was approached um, when in your discussions with law enforcement and training, et cetera. Um, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mame. Uh, I think we are going to take a couple of questions and then we will uh, go for answers. Okay, my name is Oscar Mukasa, member of parliament from Tanzania, chair of the parliamentary committee for HIV, substance use and TB. I'm curious on the Portugal, Portuguese experience on the social reintegration and how is that linked to those in the policy and political platforms? Thank you. Perhaps one more question, uh, in the, uh, all the way in the back, and then we will uh, turn to the panel. Muito obrigado. É um prazer estar a usar, portanto, a minha língua, que é a língua portuguesa. Não sei se todos estão a perceber. Um, eu sou, não é, não é uma questão. Chamo-me Belarmino Carlos Langa. Portanto, sou proveniente de Moçambique. Uh, faço parte da UNIDOS, que é a Rede Nacional sobre Drogas, uma organização de sociedade civil, tanto que opera a nível nacional. Uh, eu queria uh, fazer um comentário acerca do, do vídeo portanto, que foi projetado, uh, que serviu de uma fonte de inspiração, uh, olhando para aquilo que Portugal representa para nós, portanto, como sendo... Portanto, um país da Cplp, temos algumas similaridades em termos da língua e, e, e a outra experiência muito positiva é o, o historial, tanto o, do sucesso que Portugal tem uh, na, 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 neste assunto de redução de, de danos. E nós ainda estamos numa fase, portanto, inicial. Uh, estamos uh, em Maputo, tanto a implementar um projeto piloto com características um pouco similares, só que Portugal já está bem avançado. Estamos em parceria com a Organização Metros Sem Fronteira e a FHI. Mas, do ponto de vista daquilo que é a nossa filosofia, uh, iniciamos brevemente, portanto, num futuro muito, muito breve, a, a distribuição de, de, de seringas e agulhas, mas nós, portanto, no nosso centro, nós não estamos, portanto, uh, portanto, a, a abrir espaço para que os usuários possam o consumir observados. Este era o elemento que eu queria trazer. Então, eu não sei até que ponto é que nós podemos capitalizar, portanto, essa boa experiência de Portugal, tendo em conta este, esta aproximação oh, da língua. Muito obrigado, peço desculpa por ter eh, sido muito longo, mas... Eh, Este, estou a gozar portanto, do, do domínio da língua quando vamos a, a outros eventos temos essas limitantes da língua portuguesa e, da língua inglesa ou das outras línguas é por isso que eu sempre evoco que possa se organizar mais uma outra conferência de Berlim para vermos se nós podemos ser capacitados em língua inglesa muito obrigado thank you perhaps one of the Portuguese speakers could characterize the uh, question but I think it's about how Portugal can capitalize on the ex experience of uh, to to continue, uh, so how Mozambique can capitalize on the experience of Portugal 
to move toward uh, consumption rooms and, and other interventions after our pilot program of needle exchange, is that right? Yeah. And Joao, while you're at the podium, perhaps you can address also the some of the other questions. I think three, uh, most of the questions were addressed uh, well, not directly to me, but I I, I think uh, as to the to the police, th this was the, the the first first question I I, I kept. Uh, of course, you can find different attitudes of different people. I would say that the, the, the ancient police officers had more difficulties in dealing with this framework that we have now. Uh, there's a lot of work being done uh, between the commission, the, the, the services that were created to apply the criminalization, services under the Ministry of Health, this, uh, the commissions for the situation of drug addiction and police organizations. Uh, and they meet, they, we participate in trainings and, uh, uh, and I believe that of course we can see different uh, individual uh, positions of different professionals, but most of the police officers nowadays uh, tend to have the same kind of uh, humane approach uh, to uh, drug, to drug users, um, and uh, the repression is not the main the main form of uh, of uh, behavior uh, of the of the police officers. As to our colleague from Mozambique, uh, I would like to tell you that we are very committed to inc improve the cooperation with Portuguese-speaking countries. Um, I take this opportunity to tell you that uh, Portugal is now uh, the, uh, assuming the presidency of the Pompidou Group of the Council of Europe. And in that framework, we are w working and uh, uh, approaching also CPLP in order to find uh, ways to better cooperate uh, with Portuguese speaking uh, countries to increase the change of views, a uh, program of visits, a program of training. Uh, of course, as you know, this costs money. Uh, no Portugal is in a position to support uh, entirely this interchange of, of uh, experiences. None each one of the countries has the, that condition, so we need to find uh, some supporters. But uh, in our program uh, is uh, very high ranked the possibility of increasing that, uh, that capacity building and learning together. We are not uh, assuming any, any kind of paternalism, we are try not trying to export any kind of model. We want to work with you, analyzing your, your concrete situation and trying to, to put our experience at your display. Uh, if some of the new uh, tools are to be used, it's okay. We do the same. We did not invent the wheel. We did not invent uh, safe, uh, safe spaces for using drugs. We are learning, uh, learning and taking it from international experience, evidence of good results, and that's why we are doing it now. I also want to tell you that uh, even if uh, safe uh, use or safer use places are possible under our, our law since 2001, what happened was to, to pass that law concerning uh, safe spaces, we need the, the agreement between the central government and municipalities. And we never reached that consensus, that agreement, when we ac actually need it. In the, shortly after the, the, the year 2000, we needed, in fact, to have those, those rooms. It was not possible to find that agreement. When finally we reached the, the agreement in 2009, around it, we went to the ground, okay, we have the capacity to do it, 
And what people from the ground told us, is, oh, now it's a wrong sign because injecting drug use is falling so fast that we are going to, to against the, the mainstream. It's a wrong sign to pass to the society. But more recently, uh, during the financial crisis and social crisis that hit us so severely, we had a outbreak in injecting drug use with people that we are not reaching, we are not achieving to, to, to approach them. That's why nowadays it makes all the sense to create this new response. Okay? So, well, I think that's all. So our time is, is really done, but we want to give the last one sentence to each of the last panelists with apologies for uh, not having more time for you. And before we go to our own drug consumption, which is caffeine consumption, uh, a, a very uh, brief No, 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 break. it's just to give congratulations to APDES for bringing the International Arm Reduction Conference to Portugal and to Porto. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Luís. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Just to say that uh, about the, the, the police force or law enforcement, we actually, uh, I believe that we never had a serious, you know, training program for officials, from law enforcement, for you know the the the, the, the police agents on the ground. And actually, I don't, I, I don't know. Somehow, it at, it has results the way they were, you know, somehow um, engaging and receiving, let's say, the values and the main principles of decriminalization. But that's actually a kind of lack and obstacle that we still face in Portugal. We need more training, not only for police force, but we need more training for medical doctors, psychologists and psychologists, for people working on the ground, for drug users and so on, even for families, about drug policies, decriminalization and effects in, in general. Uh, my uh, my main question, my main uh, message is uh, treating hepatitis C is uh, a moment to give positive uh, ways of living, positive moments to uh, our uh, patients, and to avoid the spending of money in the future, and also avoiding cancers. Thank you very much. So we are now going to go for a tea break. Please uh, come back to the room at four and five minutes for the next session. <laughs> Thank you for all the presenters. <laughs>